Good morning, church. Who's excited to be here this morning? It is Sunday. It is the best day of the week. So let's go ahead and stand up. Let's worship together this morning.
Let's lift our hands together. My name is Bray Spencer, and I serve with the Chapel Kids. And my name is Kristen Spencer, and I serve on the worship team. We found Chapel KC by searching on Google. Yeah, um, we were really searching for a place that we could grow with, and that could grow with us. We were just dating at the time, but we knew we wanted to get plugged in. Uh, so we searched online and found it, checked it out one Sunday. I actually looked up some of the sermons online before we came, because I was like, what is this church all about? What's going on? Um, and I really enjoyed um, what Pastor Troy was talking about and did some more research about just um, the ministry and what goes on here. And so we came and we checked it out. And it was cool because when we were driving up, there were people going crazy outside with signs. And yeah. then when we were walking in, we got greeted by like three different people as we walked in. Yeah. So we immediately felt very welcome and 
almost like family right away. Yeah, we did. That was one thing I noticed for sure. There were people standing waiting to greet us and they were talking amongst themselves just as friends and then when we came in they stopped their conversation and welcomed us which made me feel super awesome and it was just a very inviting space it wasn't somewhere that I didn't feel out of place and just somewhere that I knew um, I would enjoy being a part of but after our first night chopper KC we were like we're excited for next Sunday to already be here right and so um, it it was pretty quick. I'd say even just the first Sunday, because mm -hmm. I mean, Troy was standing outside, just ready to invite us to coffee to hear yeah. our story and help us find a church home. Even if it wasn't Chapel KC, right. he wanted to help us find a home. So that was that. I, that's when I knew was when I was like, this pastor cares more about our well-being and not just adding members to his church. I'd say the Chapel KC has changed my life, ultimately, for better forever. Um, I was honestly truly surprised how much um, I needed this place and also how much this place has needed me to help serve and to help be a part. Um, it's definitely a commitment on both sides, but I truly have felt honored and blessed to be a part and to have part in this place. In my life, I've experienced God's blessings upon giving back. More than I even deserved. Yeah. There were times when my family did not have money to send us to the school we've gone to our entire lives. But my parents faithfully tithed and they taught us to tithe. Yeah. And all of a sudden, money would come out of nowhere for us to be able to stay with our friends at the school or do whatever. Mm -hmm. Like when we didn't know where bills were going to be paid, it would pop up. Yeah. And they never stopped tithing and they never stopped giving during times like the legacy offering. Yeah, and honestly for our family, Pastor Troy was like, pray about it, you know, consider it. You have these weeks to think and pray about it. And it honestly was a no brainer. Um, we knew that we wanted to give above and beyond, not just like Brady said, for the blessing, but for us to be able to give back in a way to invest in the future of not only this church, but of Kingdom of God. And that was something that we just knew that for us. This next song is a blessing. It's a promise for you and your families and your family's families for generations to come. So I just encourage you to come up and stand with us as we sing this next song.
give God a shout of praise. Father, we worship you. Welcome to Legacy Sunday. Listen, if you're new here, my name is Troy Bailey. I'm the lead pastor of the Chapel KC. I think you picked a great weekend to be here. If you could, look at, look at your neighbor. Say, it's good to see you. Y'all can take your seat. You can take your seat. We're going to go into a special part of our service. We do this once a year where we take up what we call as a legacy offering. And you might be wondering what that is. That is just simply to say we believe that the body of Christ, the local church, is called to leave a legacy. Amen? I don't know if you've been anywhere or you've tried to do anything, but it takes money. And I'll be straight up with you because I'm pretty transparent. God has blessed us this year. We're very, very blessed. We've grown through a pandemic. We've got about 40% of people who attend in person, about 60% watch online. Um, we've grown numerically. We've grown financially, 37% in this year, year to date. Can we give God some praise? Right? I'm thankful. I'm thankful. But God, at the beginning of us planting this church almost four years ago, he said, I need you. I need you to take one Sunday a year, and I want your church to follow my lead. What do you mean? He was like, I want you to give sacrificially. Because that's what I did. How many of y'all know we're better together? But we're stronger together. If one person can leave a legacy, imagine what a couple hundred people could do. Could leave a big legacy. And every year we've watched God do something amazing through this time, but I want you to know this isn't so much about us and this church, but it is about you individually. And we've been asking for six weeks for everyone to pray individually. If you got a spouse, pray with your spouse what it is that God would want you to give and uh, so that we could come together corporately and put it together and see what God can do. You're sitting in a miracle, if you don't know that, in this place. We were portable just six months ago, seven months ago, something like that, when God orchestrated long before there was a pandemic for us to get into this space, and we're here uh, rent-free, can we give God some praise? We worked out, I don't know how God did it, but we had this crazy God idea of how about we pitch an idea to this school and see if they'll let us fix up this space, and uh, instead of throwing $2,500 a month at a school that's just using it for, I don't know what they're using it for, but we're only allowed to get in it once a week for a few hours, but we have access to this all the time. And uh, they accepted our offer. And we've been working on this place, put new floor in, new lighting, new audio visual, all that stuff. And we got a lot of work to do. We got to do the bathrooms downstairs. If you've never used the bathrooms downstairs, you see why we are going to be renovating those. They need some love. And so a lot of what's going to come in today is going to go towards a lot of that stuff so that Together, we leave a legacy for our church and for our people that when we're gone from here, KCC has a dream that another church could come in and use this space while they're portable. It's a legacy. We have some things in 2021 we want to do and outreaches and being able to love on people. For the first time in our church's history, we were able to equip the $10,000 mark in giving for our church. Praise God. I have a dream one day to give a million dollars away. I know it's possible, but how many of y'all know you got to get to 10,000 before you can get to a million? And so God has done a thing and I am so excited for what he's going to continue to do because I planted this church with the expectation that I would be here until I die. I have no plans on going anywhere else. I just read a statistic the other day that said some 70% of pastors are looking for another profession. It's unacceptable. That people are burning out and keep throwing in the towel or just want to be done. But I want you to know that I'm as passionate as I've ever been about what God's called us to do here. And I'm thankful. Can we give our leadership team a hand clap? Because if it wasn't for our leadership team, I wouldn't, be doing, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. But I am so thankful for what God has done in our first three going on four years now. If you weren't with us back in the Turner days, we don't blame you. 
If you weren't with us in the Santa Fe Trail days, we don't blame you there either. Because there was a two-year period where everyone had to sit in metal folding chairs. And they brought butt pillows to church. But now God has opened the door and blessed us. We were able to spend a few thousand dollars on getting some comfortable chairs. Y'all thankful for that? Yeah. God is good. But this is a seed that you guys are going to be planting for your 2021. I believe that. This is what this is what Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus said, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't know about you, but for me and my family, I want our treasure to be in the local church. I might be giving financially today because that's my treasure. But I'm giving towards building a legacy in Kansas City where souls are going to be won, where I believe revival is about to break out. Marriages we've already seen being restored. Hope coming back into hearts. I don't know about you, but I want my family to be investing in a kingdom that is eternal. Our generosity opens doors for people to come to know him. When we give, it gives us the opportunity to meet felt needs and love on people. And ultimately, people come to know him. And our giving is in response to the ultimate gift that was given, which was Jesus on the cross. And we know that the the power that has transformed our lives, we want to see that same transformational power transform other lives. This is our legacy this is what it says in psalm 112 verse 9 it says never stingy always generous to those in need their lives of influence and honor will never be forgotten he's talking about the righteous the people who are right with god not by works but by faith they're never stingy always generous their lives of influence together and honor will never be forgotten for they were full of good deeds if you are sitting in a seat, you're going to see there is a legacy card in your seat. And all this is, is just going to give you a few ways that you can give, because we're about to give. Our bucket's on the inside of every row here. And while I'm praying, I just want you guys to pass the buckets. You guys can drop it in, or you can give on our app. If you're giving here in person, just mark on the other part, just write legacy so we know that that's earmarked for that specifically. But you can give on our app, you can give through text, you can give online, you can give here in person, but ultimately what we're doing is we're not giving to get. Don't get this misconstrued. We're planting seeds, yes, and I believe they will come down or come back to us. They will come back. God is faithful. He says, He says, do not lose heart in doing well. What you sow, you will reap. That's not just talking about finances. It's talking about our character. That's talking about a lot of other things. But financially speaking, I do believe that God is a provider. And that when we sow and we give sacrificially, he honors that. And it's not about the amount. It's about obedience. And if one of us can impact a life, All of us together can impact a city with 2.5 million people in it. And over 50% right now aren't a part of a life-giving church. Think about that. They're not going to church today. They're not seeking God. They they don't don't have a relationship with Him. And that's why this church exists, so that we can connect, so that we can grow, and so that we can serve. And when we connect with others, they grow in their faith. They find a place to serve. And when they serve, they connect with others. They grow in their faith and they serve and they connect with others. And it keeps going on and on and on. This is our legacy. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go be a part of something bigger than you. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. If you're wondering why we exist, 
We exist not for the church folk who come and sit here. Yes, our community is important. Our culture is amazing. But we exist for one thing and one thing only. And that is the Great Commission. That is those on the outside of these walls who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We exist for the lost. We'll leave the 99 to go after the one. We exist for one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to establish the kingdom of God in Kansas City and the surrounding areas. Whether it's through campuses or it's on our jobs. We're reaching people we exist for lost people and so I'm going to pray and you guys can give online you can drop it in the bucket later on if you're not comfortable quite yet we'll have another opportunity at the end of service but if you could grab those buckets on the inside aisles and begin to pass those and let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you God we thank you so much for everything that you've blessed us with Lord, we thank you for our jobs. We thank you for our side hustles. We thank you for the ways that you've provided for us. Lord, we know that this, these finances, they're not ours. They are yours. And God, we're saying we're going to trust you. We're going to trust the vision of your bride. order to see those who are lost come to know you. God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in 2021. Listen, 2020 wasn't the way any of us planned, but God, we know that it, was, it wasn't for nothing, that you're going to redeem it. And there's going to be some things that we're going to get to be a part of. And God, we expect a harvest to come in field is white. It is ready to be harvested. And there are souls that need to be won, that need to come back to you. God, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In Jesus' name. If you guys pass those buckets. Take it to the coffee bar for a special welcome gift. We're excited you made the decision to join us today. Nobody was meant to do life alone. We want you to feel safe. While here, we are recognizing all local health department guidelines on safety. Masks will be worn by volunteers. Distancing will be enforced where necessary. And sanitizer stations are all readily available. So come spend your time with Jesus and feel safe while doing it. When you check your child in, you received a code. In the event of an emergency, that number will appear on these screens. A chapel crew member will meet you at the staircase to escort you to meet your child. If you call the Chapel Casey home, you can give online via text or by dropping your ties in the bucket back by the coffee table. We want to be known for our generosity and God calls us to give 10% back. He can do more with 10% than we ever could do on our own. created us uniquely different. Shapes and personalities so exclusive to one's being. And we are called to fit our shapes in with others. To fellowship together. To create together. To systematically and poetically change the world as one community. How's everybody doing? I'm just going to start it over. That's what I like to see. Y'all doing good? 
Hey, uh, you know, I, I got to talk about it, right? Um, the Raiders game tonight. Some people have said we, I need to leave it alone because last time I talked about it, we lost. But I believe that God is a redeemer. And um, yeah, it's, it's not going to be pretty tonight. So I'm sorry, Steph. I know you're a Raiders fan. So I just, I'm sorry. You shouldn't have done a victory lap around the stadium. That's just one. <laughs> right? Yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it big. Hey, how many of y'all got something out of last week, if you were here? You got something? Man, God did a thing last week. And if you weren't here, it was, it was holy. It was holy. God did a work last week. And it, it's, so, it's not like our church, but people were coming down to the altar and kneeling. And it was just it was an awesome thing to see, unprovoked, by the way. And that's just not how we, it's not normally what happens. And God did a thing. And and it was just one of those that I look back, I probably should have just put the microphone down and just walked away and just let the spirit of God just sit. But it was, it was awesome. And we've been in this series called Gather, where we're talking about gathering. Like, what it, why do we do it? And we're in part four of a five-part series, so we'll finish up next week. But I want to, I really kind of want to pick up where we left off last week. If you got a Bible, let's go to Romans 1, 11 through 12. This is kind of our base uh, Scripture of our series, it says this, it says, For I long to see you, Paul talking to the church in Rome, he said, That I may impart to you some spiritual gifts, so that you may be established. Everyone say, established. I like when you talk to me, by the way, so let's just talk away. That is, that I may be encouraged, everyone say, encouraged, encouraged. together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. In other words, when we get together it's not just going to be me imparting something to you. It's going to be you imparting something to me. And that is what happens when we gather. The last three weeks we've been talking about this idea of gathering and what does Christian gathering look like in particularly and why is it important. Last week we started a talk that I ultimately want to start, uh, hopefully finish today. We might go into a third part of this, but in which God was showing us we tend to fight all wrong. That we tend to fight all wrong. So often we view the people in our lives who we know are created in the image of God, the God that we devote our lives to, and we see those people as our enemies so many times. We fight against one another instead of fighting for one another. And that's what God has called us to do. We read out of Galatians 5. Verse 13 says, for you are called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. If you have a pen and you mark in your Bible, you should underline that, you should highlight it, you should star it, you should circle it, it should be a thing that you do. Jesus said, specifically in the Gospels, that they would recognize you not by your church attendance, not by your prayer life, but they would recognize that you belong to Jesus by the way you love one another. Okay? Just because it says you're a Christian on Facebook doesn't mean we necessarily always love like a Christian should. That doesn't mean we're a doormat. Don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we just let people walk all over us, but we should have a demeanor about us that is sacrificial and loving, full of the presence of God. Sometimes, we have, listen, y'all, we have bad days, right? I mean, there's, there's, I had a week of a week. Let's just put it that way. It started with vehicle problems, and then it was all the way down to as small as I got up in the morning and went to fix my coffee and went to put the whipped cream out of the can, like, like all around, make it look all fancy and taste delicious. And the first, it just went, it was out. And I was like, this would be how the week would be. It was one of those weeks. I had to check myself. My attitude was all sorts of wrong at some point. But I got to always remind myself that it is love. And that's the way the world's going to recognize we've been with Jesus. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Lots of churches split because of this. They bite and they devour. We don't, we don't, we don't handle gossip in this house. We, 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 we just don't. Um, we'll shut it down real quick. Why? Because 
that's where, where division and dissension is. Like, that's where splits happen. That's where relationships are ruined. We tend to fight one another based upon something somebody else said. We just don't, it's just not a thing that the church should tolerate. But if you de- bite, amen, if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. Verse 16 says, I say then walk by the spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you won't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 22, drop down, says, but the fruit of the spirit is joy or love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And I say it all the time, everyone's favorite, which is self-control. That's the one I struggle with. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited thinking because we have a right relationship with God that we've got it all together and people are below us, provoking one another or envying one another. We talked about last week, the whole idea was this, staying hungry for the things of God, like keeping a hunger, those who thirst, hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus says, will be filled. God said, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. Look, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Like, let me be the God and the Lord of your life. So we talked about staying hungry for the things of God. One of the ways that we stay hungry for the things of God is by developing the fear of God in our lives. We talked about this last week, just recapping. Uh, Three ways that we develop the fear of God in our life. It isn't necessarily fearing God as like he's Zeus and has a lightning bolt. No, he's hey Zeus. He's full of love and grace and he's generous and he, but yet, Come on, the only thing that can, the only thing that's as fierce as his love is his judgment, right? But his judgment has been quenched for us who call in the name of Jesus because of what he did on the cross. Does that make sense? Okay, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. But the fear of God is not fearing that God's got like some big fly swatter and when you do wrong, he's going to smack you. Like, that's not how this thing works. The fear of God is actually just a, a holy awe of him. And the three main ways we can develop this in our lives is is to stay God conscious, like always be mindful of his presence at all times, that even though we may not feel it, it does not mean it is not there. Your feelings are fleeting. His presence is not. So being conscious of his presence at all times, even though you may not feel him, knowing his word says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Number two. Stay God aware, always aware of who he is and what he's asking you to do, being conscious of his word and aware of his of his word. And then the third one is staying God honoring, and that is living out the word of God, not just knowing it up here, but storing it in here so that you're a doer of the word of God. It's not always easy. Right. When somebody smacks you and then you're like, I'm going to turn the other cheek. That doesn't mean you give them your backside. Okay, they take take a shirt, give them your give your jacket, like just give them everything you got. Like it's not always easy to kind of walk away. It's not always easy to show love. It's not always easy to walk in these things. But God says the spirit of God lives in us and we can. We don't have to fight one another. That ultimately the enemy is not the person you're looking at. The enemy is Satan, who is in the unseen realm, who influences a lot of what we see. I'm not saying everything that comes at you is from the enemy and from Satan, but I am saying that the person who is frustrating you and annoying you and calling you out and backstabbing you and doing those things, they are not your enemy. And we do not fight these battles on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these other spaces. No, we fight our battles in our prayer closet, and we fight on our knees, and we use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So I kind of want to continue this by giving you another key component on how to not fight one another, but actually fight for one another. If you're taking notes, I need you to write this down. Write, Write down, adjust the focus. Adjust 
the focus. How many photography people I got in here? Wow. Like, what is this, like a, a club that you can't let anyone know you're a part of? I know we have at least six people in here that do photography. Can you just lift your hand up? All right, you don't have to be ashamed. Cool. Yeah. There is a thing. Yeah, iPhones count. That's true, yeah. We're all professional photographers now. Just hire me for your wedding. I'll be there. Adjust the focus. And, and, and on a lot of lenses, you, you have this, it's a focus. You have to bring it in till it's clear. This is what Matthew 6, 33 through 34 says. Jesus talking, he says, but seek first, everyone say first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And everyone said, amen. But God's saying, don't worry about the things in this world that you don't have or you're trying to achieve. Like, give that to me. Seek my kingdom first, which is what we did this morning through our legacy offering. We're seeking the kingdom of God. We're, 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 we're going all in for what God's called us as a body to do. And so uh, he's saying, don't seek those things, but seek me first. Make sure your focus is in the right place. And all these other things that everyone else is striving for and going after and plotting, uh, all those things are going to be added to you. Now, I'll be honest with you, it's not going to be in your time. It's not going to be when you want it or how you want it. But eventually, you're going to notice a lot of these things that you're wanting and desiring are going to be added to you. Now, I'm not saying this is the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it kind of stuff. Where I'm like, Jesus, I need a, I need a Rolls Royce. Like, that's what I want. I'm not saying that's what you're going to get. What I am saying, though, is you want provision in your life? God can provide that. You want protection in your life? God can provide that. You want security in life? God says, I can give you that. Like, all these things that we ultimately are wanting in life, God says, if you'll seek me first, I'll make sure as a byproduct and an overflow of that focus being in the right place, I'll make sure that that is what you have. Psalm 34, 9 through 10 says, Oh, fear the Lord, you, you his saints. There's that fear of God again. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. How many of y'all know that's a good promise? Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. I could think of a lot of good things that I want in my life. And God says, I'm not going to lack any of them as long as I am always paying attention to the focus. And I think so many times the enemy is so good at getting our focus off what is important and what has true value. And we get our focus on other things that really add no value to you. Like, oh, they did me wrong. Did you see that? Oh, heck no. And then all we do is we just sit and just think on it. Mull it over in our head. Like a little washing machine just rolling around. You're laying in bed thinking about it. Meanwhile, that person's taking a beautiful night's rest. And not even not even thinking a thing about it. But the enemy's got our focus a lot of times off of what is truly valuable in this life, which is his presence, his word, what he's called us to do. And we get our our focus so easily off on things and people so easily. And I know that in society nowadays, especially with social media, it is so easy to become, well, I say that so easy. It's not really to become famous. But more and more people, you get a viral video, and now all of a sudden you got a platform. You have no character, you have no integrity, you have no foundation, but now you're famous and you're getting millions of viewers, and now you got a lot of money, and you can buy that Rolls Royce that I was talking about. But I think that a lot of us, whether we want to admit it or not, we tend to get caught up in this game as well. 
Where we're checking how many people are following us, how many people are watching our stories, how many people are, are checking in on the things that we're putting out there in the interwebs. And, and we're, 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 we're in the struggle of like, I want to be noticed, I want to be seen, I want to be famous, I want to be popular. But, but I want to get you, get, get your focus back on the right thing because you may not admit that you're trying to be internet famous, but a lot of us are trying to be seen, Okay. And I want to ask you this question. Do you want to be famous or do you want to be faithful? Do you want to be famous or do you want to be faithful? I think that we've got to pay attention to the F's in our life. We've got to pay attention to the F's in our life. And sometimes the F's in our life are the most important. Family. Family first, right? I don't know about you, but I grew up without a dad and without a mom, and I want to make sure that my kids have both in their life. And so I've got to make sure that I'm faithful in my marriage so that my family can prosper. Amen? Got to, got to pay attention to the F's in life. Friends. Friends. You got to make sure that those relationships are solid, that you're not devouring one another, but that you truly are focused on the right thing, which is God first, and then everything else falls in behind it we have to adjust the focus a lot of times in our life to be faithful in the little things leads to a life that has a lot of things because here's a fact when they put you in that casket and they bury you which they will at some point unless jesus comes back they all your possessions are not going with you The things that you've acquired in this life are either going to your kids, your spouse, an estate sale, something. But it ain't going to you. It ain't going with you. You didn't bring nothing in. Naked you came, naked you go. Okay? Came in as dust and dirt. You're going to leave the same way. Your body is. But the possessions that you acquired over your life, they are not going with you. So ultimately, they hold no eternal value. But I will be honest with you, to be faithful in the little things will lead to a lot of things. In other words, if I'm faithful with just checking in on people and loving on people and letting them know I'm here for them, then I'm going to have a lot of friends in my life. Scripture is very clear. I tell my sons this all the time. You want to have a lot of friends? Yes, Dad. You got to be friendly. That's scriptural. You want to have friends? You got to show yourself to be friendly. But I will say this, eternally speaking as well, to be faithful is to be famous in the kingdom of God. God is looking for a generation of people who will continually have their hand on the focus of their life and make sure that that F in their life is pointed at the right thing that, that they are seeking God first above all else, that they are pay atten- paying attention not to their outward body necessarily, but they're paying attention to the health of their spirit, that they're paying attention to, to, to what it is to build a godly life and to truly pursue Him in everything. And that person may not be famous here on this earth. You may not be a celebrity preacher or a celebrity this or a celebrity that, but I guarantee you God has you down as somebody who faithfully gave, faithfully attended church, faithfully served people, faithful in your relationships, faithful in your marriage. And God says, that person is famous in my kingdom and that person is going to have something that they're going to have for eternity in my kingdom with me for eternity. I don't know about you, but I want to build a life that is built on the principles of God and not on the principles of the enemy in this world because ultimately I don't have to answer to anybody else but him and when I stand before him I only want to hear this good job faithful servant God's not going to ask how many Instagram followers did you have I only have 599 by the way does somebody want to make it 600 it's bugging me God does not care about your Instagram followers What he cares about is were you giving him the first and everything? 
First in your time, first in your, in, in your attention, first in your finances, first in every area of your life. He wants to be first. So what is the focus to be on? It's to be on the kingdom of God. The focus God is looking for is for us to be focused on the kingdom of God. I don't know if you know this or not, but we are on a mission to live for, invite to, and live with expectation for the kingdom of God. I'm going to say it again. We are on mission to live for Every day we are living for the kingdom of God. The Bible says we are aliens on this earth. And so much of us, or so many of us, are trying to just fit into this world. And I'm like, listen, honey, you're not. You're, 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 a, you're a square peg in a round hole. Like, it's not going to fit. So stop trying. Not everyone's going to like you. The world may not understand you. Your, your morals and your, your standards of life might be considered archaic or historic or old-timed or old-fashioned. But we're not trying to gain the approval of the world. We are trying to live a life that is devoted to God. And the first mark of that is how we love one another. We're not biting and devouring one another. But our singular focus should be to live for the kingdom of God. That our families are being built on the principles of Christ. That our family is being built on the bedrock that is the Bible. The Bible says that, that the word of God is sharper. It's alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive. It does a work in our life. And we want to live for the kingdom of God to establish it. But then ultimately... We want to invite others into the kingdom of God. This isn't about going to church all the time and sitting down and learning everything you can. No, this is about bringing people with you. And then we live in expectation for God to move. How do we do it? How do we keep the focus adjusted correctly? Well, I believe we do it this way. Fix our mind. Fix our mind. But I'm not talking about you just fix your, your head. Like, oh, fix your head. It's it's dumb, dumb. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we got to fix our mind. We have to set what it's fixed on. Colossians 3, 2 through 3 says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Set your minds on, on, on heavenly things, not on earthly things. To be focused is to be fixed. An unwillingness to be moved away from the thing that has grabbed your heart. George Mueller said this, he's an evangelist in the 1800s. He said, there was a day when I died, utterly died, to George Mueller. His opinions, his preferences, his tastes, and his will. Died to the world, its approval for censure. Died to the approval or blame, even of my brethren and my friends. And since then, I have only showed myself approved to God. If we want to fix our mind and set that focus and make sure that every day we have laser focus on what God's called us to do and that we're not allowing the enemy to get our eyes off onto other people and not looking at others as our enemies, not looking at others as our competition. But if we truly want to live a life that is fully just devoted to God, then we have to die to ourselves and what it is that we ultimately want and say, God, I'm going to honor you above all else. I'm going to give you first place. And even though I may not understand it, although I may not even get it for a while, I'm going to step when you say step. I'm going to run when you say run. And I'm going to stop when you say stop. Why? Because you're not just the Savior of my life. You're the Lord of my life, which means you get to say in everything I think, say, and do. Proper fellowship with one another flows from a constant, fixed, and proper relationship with the Father. Your marriage will not be the best that it can be if you are not first seeking the King of Kings. Yeah, but church folk get divorced just as many as others. Listen, just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you follow Christ. I don't want to like beat people up, but it's, it's listen, there's going to be a time coming where 
where there's going to be a proof if we truly believe what we say we believe. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how that's going to come. All I know is that there's going to be a day where just professing to be a Christian will not be sexy anymore. It won't be the thing that you put in your PR release to make your reputation gain a few points. But to have a proper relationship with your brothers and sisters has to be from a constant, fixed, proper relationship with God. I'll end with this. We've got to fix our mind on the things of God, meaning every day when we wake up, we think, God, what is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? Somebody says something on Facebook that is political or something of the, of the line that kind of ruffles your feathers a little bit, and you're typing that up, and you're all, oh, you're going to town. Y'all know what I'm talking about, where you're just like, Y'all know. And then your spouse is like, what are you doing? You're like, nothing. Because you know if you say it to her, she's going to stop you or he's going to stop you. But really what we should do is before our fingers ever touch a key, before our fingers ever touch a screen, we should be on our knees before God saying, how is it that you want me to respond? Because so many things that we get caught up in are just earthly. Meaning they're not eternal. And we're sacrificing our ability to be a witness to other people about how good God is. Because they're not seeing the goodness of God, which drives men to to repentance, flowing out of you. There's supposed to be rivers of of living water flowing out of us. But really all we got is a little trickle because we've dammed it up with all the hatred and all the hate in our lives. And God's saying, I want to bust some dams down. But you've got to do your part. You've got to adjust the focus. And listen, sometimes just because you set the focus one time doesn't mean the focus won't get out of focus again. It's a constant going back and readjusting, a constant going back. Maybe some things have gotten farther away, or maybe something's gotten a little bit closer, and you've got to adjust that focus just a little bit more. So every day when you wake up, it's not, I'm going to get on the internet and try to figure out what happened while I was sleeping. No, no, I'm, I, I got a I gotta hunger and I've got a thirst for the things of God. And then I don't care what's going on around me. All I care about is what is going on in me. So I want to get into the word of God and I want to learn his principles and I want to learn his ways so that when I gather around other people and they frustrate me because they will, they're people Do you know how you spell people? S-T-U-P-I-D. Stupid. That doesn't mean people are dumb. We just do dumb things. And sometimes we don't realize that we're influenced by more than what we see. And the enemy's baiting people all over the place, just hanging out bait. And we're like, oh, we're like that little State Farm commercial, or whatever it was, and they got the dollar bill on the fishing pole. And we're like, oh, you almost got it. Like, he's just baiting us. And we're like, just going after it. Oh, did you hear what they said? Oh, did you hear what they, what they, what they put on the internet? Oh, did you see what they were wearing? Oh, did you see the relationship they were? Did you, did you, did you? No, because my eyes were on Jesus. I'm not worried about what's going on in other other people's lives. Why? Because I'm worried about what God's doing in mine. And when he does a work in mine, then my just my presence in their presence does a work. I'm not worried about what the world says I should be worried about. No, I'm only worried about what God says I'm supposed to be worried about. Why? Because I'm an ambassador for his kingdom. And I'm not moved by what I see. I'm only moved by what I believe. My feelings come and go, but my relationship with God is everlasting. Listen, church, listen, saints, we've got to, this last point I want you to write down is this, we've got to run our race. We've got to run our race. And too many, 
So many of us are running our race like this. Yo, when I was in fifth grade, I was fast. I'll be straight up. I look white, but I'm not, okay? Fact. Genetically speaking, it's true. No, I'm just kidding. I was fast. In fifth grade, I ran a mile in five minutes and 45 seconds. I was quick. I was quick. I held the record in my, in my elementary school for five minutes and 32 seconds. That's how long I held the record. Because I finished, and I looked at Mike Katwala, which was a good friend of mine, uh, and I looked at him, and I said, beat that. And he did. <laughs> five minutes and 32 seconds later. You're like, how do you still remember that? Because I was hurt. Thought I was going to be famous. Thought I was going to go back to elementary school 20 years later. I was going to see my name on the board. And it was going to be there. It's not. And I'm not flexible. So you know the little seat reach box thing? Couldn't do it. Shuttle run, I was killer. I have no upper body definition at all. So pull-ups were not a thing. Take my shirt off. I look like I'm 12. We, thank God I can golf. Sometimes. Um, so I, I was fast. I was quick. And I remember we had this like district-wide race in fifth grade where I, like we trained for months. And I was running, I think I believe it was a 200. And in my school, boy, I was blowing everybody away. There was nobody who could keep up with me. Not even Micah. I was quick. I remember we showed up at that race. And I didn't know that when you start on an actual track, like it's all staggered. And I was like all super, super intimidated. I remember we took off. And I was on the outside lane. So I was like, I feel like I was way out ahead of everybody. And I was going. And I was for a minute out in front of everybody. But the moment I started paying attention to other people was the moment I started slowing down. I felt like I was running as fast as I could. But you cannot run fast forward when you're looking sideways. And so many times in our lives, including mine, I get caught trying to run straight for what God has called me to do. But I'm looking at everything else around me and comparing what it is that I've got going on in my life with what others got going in theirs. Or I'm looking at other people because they've got me frustrated and I'm annoyed. But yet I'm still running towards this thing. But how many of y'all know I'm not running as fast as I could be? This is what scripture says in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. He says, therefore... Since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that's the saints that have gone before us. They ran their race, now they're cheering us on in heaven. And it says, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Not Aunt Sally, who doesn't understand why you're dating somebody that looks like them. Or, or your friend Shaniqua. Everyone's got a friend named Shaniqua, right? No? Okay, fair enough. Who doesn't understand why you have such a deep passion for the things of God. Or, 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 or that person you grew up going to church with that now has stabbed you in the back and said some things about you that wasn't true, but now you've got your eyes on them and you're not running for the things that God has called you to. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was laid before him, he's giving us a little bit of an idea of how we can do this. He says, the joy that was laid before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why? Because his job 
was done. He didn't care what people were doing around him. He didn't care they were picking out his beard or nailing him to a cross or flogging him to death, like literally ripping him open. No, he focused on one thing, and that was the joy that was laid before him because he could see past the moment, and he could see through the Spirit Christians who were filled with the presence of God going out into all the world and preaching the gospel, and he was able to endure it. Saints, in these moments where we're frustrated and we're annoyed and things aren't going right and you want to get your eyes off to the left or your eyes off to the right, just stay focused on him. Fix the focus. Adjust what you're looking at. Fix your mind on the things above. Know that this is just temporary. We do not look at things that we can see. We look at the things that God says we can do. We move beyond. It's not always going to be this way. Your marriage isn't always going to be this rocky. Your relationships are not always going to be this bad. There's not always going to be a pandemic. We are running our race together. And we are called to cheer one another on. Not tear one another down. If you didn't get anything out of this today, just get this. Run every day for Jesus. Run with passion for Jesus. Run with a fixed mindset that we are here to win the lost. See your job as a mission field. Live full of the love of God that has transformed you, looking for every opportunity to pour it out on others around you who need it. Live to build the kingdom of God and not your own. all that to say this. Listen, church, God loves you. He is so madly in love with you. And he wants to do a work in you. But sometimes the, the things that he wants to do the deepest, he has to fix what is on the shallow. It means we've got to look with our eyes and our heart and realize who the true enemy is understand what we're here to do. You're not here just to be a barista or a mechanic or a teacher or, 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 or uh, an electrician or anything like that. No, you, you are, that is your job, but that is not who you are. Who you are is an ambassador for the kingdom of God, sent on a mission to tell others with your words and with your life how good God is and what he did on the cross through Jesus. Every head's bowed, every eye closed. If you are in here today, I'm going to give you two opportunities. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to put you on blast. I just want you to lift your hand. But if you say today, Troy, I don't know Jesus like this. I, I, I went to church. I, I've, I've, I've prayed. I've read my Bible. But, like, I've never known him as Lord of my life, somebody who gets the say in everything. But I want to come to him today give my life to him or maybe you're in here today and you say Troy I knew him at one time but I walked away I gave my life to other things I started building my own kingdom my own life started doing things my way but I want to come back to my first love and I want to rededicate my life to him if that's you today you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you want to rededicate just lift up your hand Father we worship you I see that hand over there we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in this place, Lord. You are so faithful. I see that hand. If you raise your hand, pray with me. Church, if you believe in what they're doing, pray with me as well. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for me. I confess all my sins. And I thank you but I am your child, an ambassador for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would raise your hand.
there's a little connect card on there. If you could just write in there that you accepted Jesus today, whether you rededicated or you gave your life to him for the first time so that we can have record. We know who we're going on a journey with. You could drop it in the offering bucket in the back as well. If you're also new, please go back there. We have uh, coffee mugs we would love to give you um, to say and thank you for coming to check out what God's doing here. But also, if you weren't able to give in the beginning and the legacy offering, maybe you came in late or you just weren't ready, you can always fill it out on the offering envelope or give online right now, or you can drop it in that bucket in the back as well. Church, can we give a hand clap for them? It's the greatest decision they will ever make. If you could stand up, we're just going to worship for just a moment.
look at your neighbor and say, go Chiefs! Go with this mist. Have a great week. We love y'all.